talking with Roger Moore, James Bond in London, about the new James Bond film, The Spy Who Loved Me. Roger, this film is being promoted as the biggest and the best of the Bond films, and I am inclined to agree. Well, I'm glad you feel <laughs> that way. I hope the public <laughs> does, too. All too often, films, I think, have trouble living up to their um, publicity campaigns, but are you pleased with it? Uh, well, last night, I saw it at the same time as you did. Um, you know, the completed version I'd seen, uh, a rough cut, and I'd seen a couple of dubbed reels. But my overall feeling about the film, you know, is that I marvel at the technology of it. Some of the matte shots in it, you know, the technical things, you know, that only people in the profession basically know what it is and the work that's gone into it. And they're masterful in that mm -hmm. sense. And I think one of the unsung, or perhaps not unsung, heroes of the film is Ken Adam. No, he like sings his name pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> no, and he is, you know, he's well worth his money. In fact, he's grossly underpaid mm -hmm. for what he does. And also his team, people like Derek Meddings, and the special effects, they're absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. How do you go about preparing for a Bond film? Is it any different from any other role that you study for or prepare for? Uh, well, having uh, sort of done three, I don't really have to do much sort of homework on the background of the character, which I, I did before I did the first one. There are occasional things like in the one before last, in Man with the Golden Gun, I had to do Kung Fu and Karate, and so I had to do a crash course in that, mm -hmm. which was very uncomfortable. But on this one, I didn't really have to uh, learn to do anything special apart from riding the wet bike. Mm -hmm. What is the toughest thing for you to prepare for in any Learning film? lines. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I, it's, it's a difficult question. You know, we were talking before we started this about Sherlock Holmes. That, in itself, was, was a difficult mm -hmm. thing to do. A, because of the amount of dialogue and being very stilted Victorian English, which is sort of not in usage today, you have to really learn it. And also, I played it at, or tried to play it at a tremendous pace, because I felt that was the, way, the only way the character was going to work for mm -hmm. me. And so that required preparation in the sense that I learned it, but even up until the first minute of shooting on the first day, I didn't know what direction I was going with it. Really? And I thought, well, maybe Boris Sagan, who directed it, will give me a clue. And he just mapped out the shot, and he said, have fun, Roger. And he said, have fun, <laughs> yes, that's what I'll do. I'll have fun. So I played it like a strangulated wrong call. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked for me. Do you like a lot of direction in a film, or do you like to more or less work things out on your own? Uh, well, I think it is important that you come to a scene prepared. You, uh, you must know the character, you must know the way the scene is going. The laying out of it, you normally work out with the director. I loathe being told you're going to stand there and go there and go there. I, I'm inclined to say, why? Mm -hmm. You know, surely it would be better to do this. and. I've been fortunate that most directors I've worked with, you know, think like I do, so I never have any problems. Well, I don't understand really how some directors can plan things out to such a minute detail that they, in effect, exclude their actors from what they're doing. Well, they, they had a, a program that ran on BBC here a few years ago, which was it's sort of in-depth interviews with directors, and there was one director who should be nameless that I had seen that particular evening. And he went on for an hour and a half explaining his films, that he didn't know what they were about <laughs> when he was making them, and he said nobody did when they saw them. But he went on and on, you know, and it was completely... And I was talking with the director I was working with at that time the next day, and he had been the first assistant to Ken Hughes when they'd made, um, with Peter Finch, the Oscar Wilde story. And the important thing is communication. And he said, that Hughes was doing an interview, more or less the same th uh, type of thing as this BBC interview, where they, the interviewer was saying there was such marvellous nuances of homosexuality that you obtained from Finch in his role as Oscar Wilde. There was a subtle underlying depth in the man. And he went on and on. He said, how did you achieve this with Peter? And Ken says, well, I go up to him in the morning and I say, puff it up a bit, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> and that basically is is what direction is about. It is communication in the simplest form. <laughs> you know, it's either sit down, you idiot, but not, don't you think it would be better? <laughs> that could drive you mad. But I have observed on sets, and of course you have, 
Some directors, if they don't like what the actor is doing, they will castigate it in front of the entire crew. And that seems to me to really destroy an actor's uh, ego, because when an actor is acting, he you know, is in effect wearing his feelings on his sleeves. It doesn't help. I uh, will not mention the director's name because it may be libelous, but uh, a, a man who had been his first assistant assured me it was absolutely true that an actress played a scene and he said, I cut, he said, I wind her up, I put her down, and she don't go. <laughs> Get me Spotlight, which is a casting directory. And they recast the part in front of the whole oh, actress. That's bad. It's not good. Yeah. <laughs> I would burst into tears if they did it to me. <laughs> if you directed a film, how do you think you would treat your actors? Well, I, I have directed. I directed not, not uh, in film for theatrical release, but for television. Mm -hmm. I directed about 10% of the scenes and The Persuaders. I, because I'm an actor and I suppose sensitive to the way actors feel, I let them play at it then offer my suggestions. Or if, you know, you don't have time to give acting lessons in uh, television. People have to be prepared. Mm -hmm. And I can remember one friend I was working with, because I always work with friends, it's much easier. Uh, all I had to say to him, you know, was, I think the man has ulcers. And he then immediately grabbed onto that. It was the, the, the handle he wanted for the character. And so he played it with stomachache all the way through. Maybe it was my direction. <laughs> Let's get back to the Bond film for just a minute. For those who are, are unfamiliar with the story, in fact, this story was not by Ian Fleming, was it? No, and the original, the original story wasn't by Fleming either. I believe it was not, anyway. But his wishes were that uh, the title could be used, but not the story, because it really wasn't about Bond, the original book. It was all about some girl in a motel in uh, New England or something. Mm -hmm. All right, well, where does this story take James Bond? Well, the story, uh, well, James, uh, James Bond told it takes a story, actually. <laughs> uh, it is at the beginning, uh, two Polaris submarines are swallowed up by a giant tanker owned by Kurt Jurgens, Mr. Stromberg, and the Russians and the British have to get together. And so they put their best agent on it, Triple X, uh, Barbara Bach, and the British put their best agent on it, they couldn't get Sean Connery, so they got me. <laughs> and uh, it's a question of foiling Mr. Stromberg's plans to destroy uh, civilization because he wants the world beneath the sea. Well, that sounds like a, a reasonable request to me. Yeah, well, it's not bad, is it, if you're a fish? <laughs> <laughs> How much bigger can the James Bond films get? Uh, well, well, you say left? that I, what is left, they'll find something. Cubby will find something, you know, Ken Adam and mm -hmm. Lewis Gilbert will direct the next one. They spend a long time thinking up things, finding ideas, and going all over the world looking for them. They start, I think, in about three weeks' time on <laughs> locations in South America where Bond has never been shot. Mm -hmm. So they're going down there to find out what is unusual, what is, uh, is scenic value. And will you be James Bond in the next one? Uh, if they put bullets in my gun, <laughs> yes. No, I wonder if there's been any thought of returning to, um, let's say, the simpler bond of um, From Russia With Love, where he was, it was just a, a spy story. Uh, well, I think, I think the audience is rather, they like gimmickry, and uh, they like spectacle. Today's market is that, you know, the films that are popular today. And I, they expect that of Bond. I don't think Bond can go back to being small. Mm. I think Bond has to be bigger. Mm -hmm. All right. In addition to James Bond, what are you working on now? I'm going to start a film called Wild Geese, which is a story of mercenaries in Africa. Mm -hmm. In a few weeks' time, I go off with Richard Burton about Lancaster. Roger, I want to thank you for taking this time, and please come to Atlanta and see us. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thank you. I haven't been there since they burned it down and gone with the wind. <laughs> it's changed. I would hope so.